Greetings, my precious brothers and sisters. May grace and peace be multiplied unto you all from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to our 76th study in the book of Ephesians, the sovereign God and the mystery of his will. We are making our way very slowly. Hopefully, we are not uh, boring you, but you are being blessed by the painstaking approach that we are taking, just trying to extract everything that we can out of each verse. Our subject this evening is imitators of God. And um, we're reading Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. Yes, we are finally finished with chapter 4. And I think we spent 39 lessons just on chapter 4. So we're going to begin chapter 5 this evening. We're reading verses 1 and 2. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering, and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for, for this opportunity to come and to listen to your word, your precious, life-transforming word, the word of life, the word that is able, Lord God, to save us. Please help us, Lord, both to speak and to hear and to have a heart to be conformed to your word. This we ask in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen. In this lesson, we will begin to consider the fifth chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Some of you may remember that in Lesson 37, we had stated that Chapter 4 was an important dividing point in Paul's letter to the believers in Ephesus and the surrounding regions. We noted then that the first three chapters contained doctrinal instruction. The last three chapters contain exhortation. This is always the proper order, for it is in doctrine that believers are informed about their exalted position in Christ, which alone makes the exhortation to live holy lives a reasonable one. It is in doctrine that believers become aware of all the resources of grace that they possess, which alone can enable them to obey the exhortation. Until a person has been exposed to sound doctrine, it is unreasonable to expect them to live an exalted Christian life. Persons must first know who they are in Christ before they are told how they ought to live for Christ. In other words, brothers and sisters, it is when we come to understand how exalted our position is in Christ that we can be exhorted, that we can be empowered, 
empowered to live an exalted life. It is our position in Christ that is going to allow us to practice our Christianity in any reasonably effective way. Accordingly, we went on to say in the first half of the letter, chapters 1 to 3, Paul informs the Ephesian Christians about what God has accomplished for them in Christ and as a result all that they have become in Christ as well as the resources that he has placed at their disposal to help them to live victorious Christian lives. In the second half of the letter, chapters 4 to 6, he exhorts the saints living in Ephesus to conduct their lives in a manner which would demonstrate that they understood and appreciated all that God had done for them in Christ, all that they had become in Christ, and all the spiritual resources that were now at their disposal. The Christian life, we said, is not to be based on ignorance, but on knowledge. And the more we are exposed to the doctrines of the Bible, and the better we understand them, the easier it will be for us to obey the exhortations of the Bible. There are persons who say, I am not interested in doctrine. I just want to live a Christian life. Such persons are revealing their ignorance of the way the Holy Spirit works in the life of the believer. It is not possible for a person to live a Christian life if he or she is unaware of their position in Christ and the resources that are at his or her disposal, which alone can empower him or her to live such a life. There are others who argue that it makes no difference what you believe, just as long as you live right. This is a similar confession of ignorance. What a Christian believes makes all the difference in the world because what you believe will determine how you behave. It is the practice of the writers of the New Testament to explain the doctrine to their readers before asking them to apply the doctrine. We must not act until we are clear about what the Bible has to say about our action. The truth is, brothers and sisters, in many cases, new converts are not taught much doctrine at all and that is the reason why they live such shallow lives and what we want to avoid at the grace workshop ministries is having an assembly that is a mile wide but only an inch deep it is doctrine that allows us to send roots deep down into the soil of Christianity so that the resulting tree is strong and powerful and fruitful. Without doctrine, we only can have very shallow lives. In order to emphasize the balance between doctrine and duty, in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, we looked at the sym symmetrical structure of the letter. So we want to do that again. We did it in an earlier lesson, but we want to look at this balance between doctrine and duty. It is so very important. So in chapters 1 to 3, what 
is emphasized is the doctrinal the doctrinal aspect of the Christian walk in chapters 4 to 6 what is emphasized is the practical Christian walk so the doctrinal aspect is what informs the practical walk in chapters 1 to 3 what is emphasized is the position of the believer in chapters 4 to 6 Paul emphasizes the practice or the life of the believer in chapters 1 to 3 what he deals with is the believer's spiritual wealth whereas in chapters 4 to 6 he emphasizes the believer's spiritual walk in chapters 1 to 3 he looks at how God sees us in Christ in chapters 4 to 6 he looks at how the world should see Christ in us in chapters 1 to 3 he emphasizes the privileges of the believer in chapters 4 to 6 he looks at the responsibilities of the believer and finally in chapters 1 to 3 he deals with the work of Christ in us and in chapters 4 to 6 he looks at the work of Christ through us so we have this beautiful balance between doctrine and duty between position and practice it is very necessary for us to understand that without this this balance between doctrine and duty we have a lopsided Christianity one way or the other now in chapter 5 the Apostle Paul continues the exhortations which he had begun in chapter 4 so in Ephesians 5 1 he writes be ye therefore followers of God as dear children the New English translation renders the verse the verse as follows therefore be imitators of God as dearly loved children be be imitators of God as dearly loved children the word therefore introduces a logical result or inference from what has gone before so we need to remind ourselves of what Paul had written in verses 25 to 32 of chapter 4 the New English translation renders the passage as follows therefore having laid aside falsehood each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor because we are members of one another be angry and do not sin do not let the sun go down on the cause of your anger do not give the devil an opportunity the one who steals must steal no longer instead he must labor doing good with his own hands so that he will have something to share with the one who has need you must let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth but only what is beneficial for the building up of the one in need that it would give grace to those who hear and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption you must put away all bitterness, anger, wrath, quarreling, and slanderous talk. Indeed, all malice. Instead, be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. In this passage, Paul provided the Ephesian believers 
with a list of specific sins which were characteristic of the old man. These sins were to be put off. He also provided a list of the contrasting virtues which were characteristic of the new man. These virtues were to be put on. Since the old man with all his accompanying lusts has been put off and the new man who is created in the righteousness and holiness of the truth has been put on, the lifestyle of a believer should demonstrate that a radical change has occurred. The word therefore connects this putting off of the sins of the old man and the putting on of the virtues of the new man with the command to be imitators of God. Paul says, be therefore followers of God as dear children, followers of God. The Greek word translated followers or imitators is mimetes, which refers to an imitator. It speaks of the process of observing and replicating the behavior of another, observing and replicating the behavior of another. Our English word mimic comes from this Greek word. The word mimetes is always used positively in the New Testament to describe the imitation that arises by admiring the example of someone who is deemed to be worthy of emulation. It is used of believers emulating a God-approved example. Paul is arguing here that children are like their parents. Children probably learn more by watching and imitating than by any other way. If we are the children of God, then we ought to imitate our Father. Brothers and sisters, a mimic does not say anything. He or she employs the theatrical technique of suggesting action, character or emotion without words. He or she uses only gesture, expression, and movement. Paul is saying in effect here, don't simply talk about God's love. Live it out. Practice it. Don't tell people that you have it. Demonstrate to them that you do by imitating him. Do as God does. We have all been amused at little children when we see them imitating their fathers or mothers. And we say, that's just what his father would do. That's just what her mother would do. Well, are we imitating our Heavenly Father? Are we doing just what he would do? Paul is asking us, he's urging us, he's exhorting us to imitate God. Brothers and sisters, do you see the, the high calling with which God has called us? We are to be imitators of him. If we are to be like God, we must mimic him and let our 
actions speak louder than our words. By being kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32 That is the way to imitate God because this is how God has reacted to us. Brothers and sisters, God has been kind to us. He has been tender-hearted. He has forgiven us. We must imitate these characteristics of our Heavenly Father. This is what Christianity is all about. It is not coming on a Sunday to sing songs and to shout loudly and to greet each other and to speak in tongues and to say that we have had a good time. It is about learning how to imitate our Father. Be ye therefore followers of God. The word be is a translation of the Greek word ginomai, which we looked at, I think, last week. This word means to become, to come into being, to bring into existence. Now, the believers in Ephesus had already been born again. They had been justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. They had come into being, so to speak, in the sense that they had been saved and by virtue of that fact had been positioned in Christ. But now Paul exhorts them to come into being as it relates to their practice of Christ, their practice of Christ. We need to bring into existence the imitation of God. The verb is in the present imperative. It is a command calling for continual imitation. We are to continue continually mimic God's attitudes and actions. We are to copy him. Brothers and sisters, we are not called to be who we want to be. We are called to be like God. There can be no higher calling. We are called to emulate God. The command reminds us of Jesus' words in Matthew 5, 48. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Our Lord is speaking here of the consistent direction of our lives, not the absolute perfection of our lives. In other words, the measuring rod by which we are to measure ourselves is God himself. Uh, brothers and sisters, hear me. Jesus does not expect us to achieve absolute perfection in this life. He knows that we will not do so. Nevertheless, the standard by which we are to judge ourselves is the perfection of God himself. That is what we must consistently aim for. You see, brothers and sisters, if you judge yourselves, um, if you measure yourselves by me, and if I measure myself by you, we might come out looking fairly good. But if we measure ourselves by God himself, our Father, all of us come out looking very unimpressive, to say the least. 
least. So you see, it makes no sense for you to judge your walk with God by looking at me. And I wouldn't be helping myself if I measure my walk with God by looking at you, how I compare with you. How do I compare with God? That's the true test. And we all know what are the results of that test already. In, in, in this regard, in light of the fact that we are to measure ourselves by God himself, I want us to consider two passages of scripture, both rendered by the New English Translation. Matthew chapter 5, 43 to 45. Matthew 5, 43 to 45. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to, to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be like your father in heaven. That's the reason why we are to do it. We are his children. Since he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous, God sends his common grace to everybody. Brothers and sisters, Jesus says, love your enemy. Upon what basis, what is the ground of his appeal? What is he basing his appeal on? Well, on the fact that when he died to save us, we were God's enemies. God saved us while at, at the time when we were his enemies, at the time when we were persecuting him, so to speak. So Jesus is saying, as his children, you do the same. Brethren, as I have been saying to us, unless we are prepared to grapple with see if 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 for us Christianity is coming and shouting and having a good time, then we can ignore all of this. But if if we are if we are serious about biblical Christianity, I'm not talking about what an organization says Christianity is. If we are serious about biblical Christianity, then we are going to have to grapple with these things which are so so contradictory to our human nature. But let's look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 13. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves has been fathered by God and knows God See there again. If we are his children, if he is our father, we must imitate him. The person who does not love does not know God because God is love. By this, the love of God is revealed in us that God has sent his one and only son into the world so that we may live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if God so loved us, then we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God resides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we reside in God and he in us in that he has given us of his spirit. 
In both these passages, we are exhorted to imitate God. The basis of the exhortation is God's example, which we are to mimic because we are his children. Children do what they see their parents doing. Who is your father? Who is my father? Why are we not doing what our father does? But how can we be imitators of God? No man had seen God at any time. How can we be imitators of God? We can only do so by imitating Jesus Christ because he is the one who reveals God to us. The following verses of scripture bear out this truth, the truth that Jesus is the one who reveals God to us. John 1, 18, no one has ever seen God. The only one, himself God, who is in the closest fellowship with the Father, has made God known. John 5, 19, so Jesus answered them, I tell you the solemn truth. The son can do nothing on his own initiative, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. Oh, I love that. I love that not only because it is a clear indication that Jesus is the one who reveals the Father, but it is a challenge to me because here is my elder brother, Jesus Christ, my elder brother according to the flesh, saying whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. He's saying to me, if you are his child, you should be doing what he does. Second Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, is the one who shined in our hearts to give us the light of the glorious knowledge of God in the face of Christ. So Christ is the one who reveals God. So you ask me, Pastor, how are we to mimic God? How are we to imitate God? We do so by imitating Jesus Christ, who revealed God to us. Brothers and sisters, we must imitate our Heavenly Father by imitating Jesus Christ. In 1 John 2, 3 to 6, the apostle says, and we are reading from the New English translation. Now by this we know that we have come to know God if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know God and yet does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in such a person. But whoever obeys his word, truly in this person, the love of God has been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Listen to this. The one who says he resides in God ought himself to walk just as Jesus walked. So John is saying to us, all right, you have a difficulty understanding how you are to imitate God. Well, let me make it a little easier for you. The one who says he resides in God ought himself to walk just as Jesus walked. So we have a responsibility. We have a privilege let me call it a privilege rather than a responsibility to imitate jesus christ and if we do that we are imitating god 
We must be engaged in the process of observing Jesus Christ as he is revealed to us in scripture and replicating his behavior. When we read the Gospels, brethren, the writers of the Gospels draw a portrait of Jesus Christ. We see his glorious life. We see the excellence of his character traits coming out. And we are now supposed to look at that and take these things into our prayer closet and say, God Almighty, help us to replicate this behavior. The Holy Spirit who indwells us is desirous of impressing the character of Jesus Christ deep within us. And we must facilitate this process by consistently yielding to him. So when we, when we read about the life of Jesus, and when we are struck by the beauty and the awesomeness and the effect, Caciousness of that life. The Holy Spirit has a great desire and it is part of his ministry to impress that beauty and that awesomeness and that efficaciousness into our spirits deep within the core of who we are. But he must be facilitated by us as we yield to him. So, one of the questions I want to ask us, are we reading? Are we availing ourselves of the information concerning the life of Jesus? Paul says, therefore be imitators of God. How? As dearly loved children. That's the New English translation. As dearly love the children. The word as is a comparative particle in Greek. Paul is indicating both the manner in which the imitation is to be done and the reason for it. He's indicating both the manner in which the imitation is to be done and the reason for it. He's saying to us, let me tell you how you should imitate God as dearly loved children. And let me give you the reason for imitating God. Because you are dearly loved children, how you should do it is in the way that dearly loved children imitate their parents. And why should you do it? Because you are his children. Because he's your father and you want to be like your father. There can be no sure proof of the genuineness of a person's salvation than their desire to be like Jesus. Their desire to imitate their heavenly father. He says that the believers are the dearly loved children of God. They have experienced his love and forgiveness. And as his dearly loved children, they should be motivated to imitate his love and forgiveness. Oh, brothers and sisters, oh, if this could only be impressed deep within us. Hear me now. The words dearly loved, dearly loved, are a translation of the Greek word agapetos, agapetos, a verbal adjective derived from agape, which refers to a love called out of one's heart by the preciousness of the object loved. Agapetos is the word that the father uses to refer to his son. 
So in Matthew 3, 17, Matthew 12, 18, Matthew 17, 5, when the father is referring to his son, he calls him, this is my beloved son, or this is my dearly loved son, in whom I am well pleased, or hear ye him, hear him. So this is the word that God uses agapetos to refer to Jesus Christ, his son. But, and this is almost mind blowing. I don't know. I hope we can get the significance of this. This same word, agapetos, which God uses to refer to his son, Jesus Christ, is also applied to us as believers, those of us who are reconciled to God and have been judged by him to be worthy of eternal life. In other words, his elect. It is used to refer to persons who have personally experienced the agape love of God. Romans 1.7, 1 Thessalonians 1.4, Colossians 3.12. In other words, God the Father sees us now and forever as his very own children because we are eternally in his Son. He calls Jesus Christ Agapetos and he calls wretches like us Agapetos. Oh, brothers and sisters, what else can God do to demonstrate how much he loves us? Who else but God would associate us with Jesus Christ? Who else but God would call us by the same name? We wouldn't do that. But God does. Brothers and sisters, this marvelous truth is highlighted in an almost incredible statement made by our Lord in John 17, 20 to 23, as he prayed to his Father on our behalf. The New English translation translates the passage as follows. I am not praying only on their behalf, but also on behalf of those who believe in me through their testimony, and that they will all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. I pray that they will be in us. Well, there are serious implications from that, but um, that's not my burden this evening. So that the world will believe that you sent me. The glory you gave to me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me that they may be completely one. Listen now, so that the world will know that you sent me and you have loved them just as you have loved me. Just as you have loved me, you love them just as you have loved me. Verse 23 contains perhaps the most remarkable expression to ever proceed out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. It is an almost incredible statement, almost unbelievable. We are told in this verse that God the Father loves us, his own, as much as he loves his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. The love of God is radically different from our natural way of loving. We are drawn to love persons who are appealing. 
we are attracted by certain qualities that we find in them that stimulates us in a pleasing way. We love persons for what we find in them, but that is not how God loves. God loves persons not for what he finds in them, but for what he finds in himself. He does not love his own because they are good. He loves them because he is good. He loves the loveless in order to make them lovable. The love of God reaches into the deepest, darkest, murkiest, nastiest parts of us and embraces us as we are are not as we are considered by others to be or even the way we consider ourselves god loves us so creatively so intimately so tenderly and so consistently that if we ever came to realize how much he loves us our self-esteem would immediately be enhanced. Our fears would be banished. Our defense mechanisms would be dismantled. If we ever realized how much God loves us, we could abandon our self-righteousness. We could stop pretending that we have everything in control. We could take our masks off. I'm not talking about the COVID masks. I'm talking the masks that we put on to cover up who we really are on the inside. We could take those masks off and quit being hypocrites. We could become more open, more honest, more vulnerable more authentic, more Christ-like. Mm. Brothers and sisters, if we are indeed the dearly loved children of God, then we should love each other creatively, intimately, tenderly, and consistently. Since our Father looked beyond our fault and saw our need, so we, his children, in imitation of him, should look beyond the fault of each other and see the need that exists. We should love them even though they may be as unlovable as we are. This is a love that can only be produced by the Holy Spirit. It cannot be manufactured by the flesh. It cannot be decreed and declared, I'm sorry. It cannot be prophesied. It has to be produced by the Holy Spirit as we yield to him. The New Living Translation renders 1 John 4, 16 to 18 in the following way. And I want us to consider this carefully. 1 John 4, 16 to 18. We know how much God loves us. And we have put our trust in his love. Oh my, how many of us have put our trust in his love? If we have not, one of the reasons is, I am sure, that it is because we do not know how much he loves us. See, John says that we know how much God loves us. And because we know, we have put our trust in his love. God is love. God doesn't have love. God is love. If we were to distill all the character, all the attributes, all the excellences of God down to uh, their essence, that essence would be love. 
God is love. And all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear. Such love has no fear. Because perfect love expels all fear. When John says such love has no fear, what is he talking about? Because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. You see, um, the way probably this verse was taught to us, or the way we understood it from a works-based performance-driven perspective was that such love has no fear being our love for God. In other words, if I can only love God more, I would have no fear because perfect love expels all fear. But that's not what God is trying to communicate to us in this verse. He's saying to us, if we have fear, if we don't have any assurance, if we are constantly terrorized by the fact that we will never be ready for the rapture. John says it is because we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Not because we don't love him as much as we should, but because we don't know how much he loves us. If we understood how much he loves us, not only would we have assurance, not only would our fear be banished, but that love that he has for us would generate in us a love for him. See it there in verse 19, we love each other because he loved us first. We love each other because he loved us first. Um, I just want to mention this here because there are some translations including the King James, which says, we love him because he first loved us. Well, there is no object in the Greek. Let me read the New English translation's footnote, a very interesting footnote concerning verse 19. Remember again, verse 19 says, we love each other because he loved us first. The footnote says, no object is supplied for the verb love. So the Greek text does not say we love God or we love each other. No object is supplied for the verb love. The author, that is John, with his propensity for obscurity has left it to the readers to supply the object. The obvious objects that could be supplied from the context are either God himself or other believers, the brethren. It may well be that the author has both in mind at this point. The statement is general enough to cover both alternatives. Although the following verse, which we are going to read now, verse 20, puts more emphasis on love for the brethren. So verse 20 says, if someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar, for if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? So if you look at it very carefully, it would seem to be more appropriate for verse 19 to be saying we love each other because he first loved us, he loved us first. There again, brethren, is the whole, whole uh indication the whole the whole impression the whole appeal that we should love each other because our father loved us 
He loved us first and his love for us should teach us to love each other. It certainly will teach us to love him as well, but it will teach us to love each other. The dearly loved are those to whom the Father has shown the love spoken of in 1 John 3, 1 to 3. The New English translation furnishes this rendering of the passage. See what sort of love the Father has given to us. What sort of love? How can we see it? How can we measure this foreign type of love? That's what the Greek literally means. This foreign type of love that the Father has given to us. How can we measure it? That we should be called God's children. And indeed we are. You see that, brothers and sisters? This is the foreign type of love, the degree of love, the sort of love that we, you and I, wretches, fit only for the lake of fire. We, who have done unspeakably wicked things, some of us, all of us sinful wretches, we should be called God's children, agapetos, the dearly loved ones of God, beloved. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Dear friends, we are God's children now. We're not going to be God's children when we get to heaven. You know, brothers and sisters, I do have a little bit to say. <laughs> about the whole matter of us going to heaven. Some of us are living to go to heaven and missing life right now. If we're not careful, we're going to miss heaven too. But anyway, that is those of us who are not really saved and are just not even understanding that what we are to do is to live now. Jesus in his prayer said, don't take them out of the world. Leave them right here so that they can be lights right here. Just keep them. Don't take them out. That's another subject. Dear friends, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that whenever it is revealed, we will be like him. Because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope focused on him, purifies himself just as Jesus is pure. The dearly loved ones of God are those who purify themselves because they have a hope of becoming like God. You see, they are so discontent with their present situation they have such a strong desire to imitate god to be like god to imitate jesus to be like jesus that that is their hope it's really not heaven but is it is to be brought to a stage where we are like him entirely so to speak Oh, the dearly loved children of God. The word children is a translation of the Greek word technon, which refers to a child as viewed in relation to his or her parents or family. Dearly loved children. It describes those who are regarded as true, genuine children. Earlier, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, Paul used the same word technon to indicate that prior to our conversion, we were by nature children of wrath. Technons, children of wrath. Remember that I just said the word describes those who are regarded as true, genuine children. There was a time when we were regarded as the true, genuine children of wrath. 
Now he uses the same word technon to speak of us as God's dearly loved children, true children, genuine children of God. As someone has observed, what a contrast three chapters make. Paul is saying in effect to his readers, when you were children of wrath, you lived in obedience to the devil who was your father. No, that you are the dearly loved children of God. You should now be continually motivated by a desire to walk in a manner pleasing to your new father. Oh my God, help us. Brothers and sisters, it is very important for us to understand that we cannot be imitators of Jesus Christ in our own strength. The only way to imitate the life of Jesus is by relying on the same power that he relied on to obey his father. That power was of course the Holy Spirit. Albert Osborne, the sixth general of the Salvation Army, wrote the hymn, Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. It is my prayer that all of us who worship at the Grace Workshop Ministries will exemplify in our lives the words of the opening verse of this hymn as we seek to become imitators of God. And I'm going to pray this prayer as we close. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All his wondrous compassion and purity. O oh, thou spirit divine, all my nature refine till the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Thank you, Lord.